General Electric's Summer Theater. Tonight we present Mr. Dana Andrews in Joseph Hergesheimer's exciting story, The Token, brought to you by the General Electric Company, makers of famous, dependable kitchen and home laundry appliances. Carpenter inviting you to the General Electric Summer Theater, a half hour of outstanding dramatic entertainment featuring Hollywood's greatest stars. It's true, you can't buy refrigerators the way you buy candy. A refrigerator costs too much. You really need value. That's why eventually so many people settle on General Electric's new Roto Cold refrigerator. What is Roto Cold? Well, uh, let me explain it like this. In many refrigerators, you'll find a wide range of temperature difference from the top to the bottom shelf. The bottom of such a refrigerator might even be warm. Now, that's pretty unsafe for fresh foods. But General Electric's revolutionary Roto-Cold spins cold air into every nook, corner, and cranny of your refrigerator. Keeps the temperature safe for fresh foods top to bottom shelf. No more warm spots. And, of course, there's more in this great General Electric. There's a genuine food freezer that holds up to 48 packages of frozen foods. There's a full-width chiller tray, door shelves, and a couple of dozen other conveniences. And here's another thought. This General Electric Roto-Cold refrigerator is built with the same sealed-in system that's kept over three and a half million GE refrigerators still giving grand service after 10, 15, and even 20 years. You can have this fine refrigerator for only about $3.90 a week after a small down payment. See your General Electric dealer. He can give you the exact term. And now here's our star, Mr. Dana Andrews. One of the most fascinating cities in America is Salem, Massachusetts. The mention of its name never fails to stir up visions of witches and wizards, and also to bring to mind those fabulous days when smart Yankee clippers plowed through all the oceans of the world in search of wealth and adventure. And so, Salem is a perfect setting for The Token, a story by one of our most distinguished authors, Joseph Hergesheimer. <laughs> By now six in the evening, I was standing at the taffrail of the Triton, watching the log line that ran from the wake and strained back as the ship worked homeward. She was a square-rigged ship with three masts bound for Salem after two years' trading voyage to the other side of the world. I stood there, looking back and thinking that I had no great desire to be nearing home. Just then, Seth Hawes, first mate and a good friend, came up to the rail beside me. It's you, Van Kalef. Hello, Seth. Squally weather. We've seen worse. We have by far. Phineas Cassidy can't sell his head. What? I said Phineas Cassidy can't sell his head. Well, why not? It's broke. That's why he can't sell it, I guess. Who broke it? Phineas himself. He broke it. His last one. He kept it in his bunk while he slept. Rolled over on it last night, smashed it. Ah, you lie. <laughs> it's not his own head, I mean. It's one of them little shrunk up heads he bought from a savage in New Zealand. Far out than he had, strung on a string like onions. <laughs> well, then perhaps I'll buy it. What for, Ben? A uh, sort of a token of the voyage. Seems you told me your caliph's got a token. Yes, yes, I've not forgotten. Tell me, Ben, what's it look like, this family token of yours? Oh, it's just a gold coin of the Orient, stamped with a lot of strange signs. You really believe in it, eh? Well, Seth, it's an old family tradition I was brought up with. You see, if a caliph man gives it to a woman, then he marries her, no matter what. And you gave it to Annis Ballard. Yes, just before we sailed. That seems a long time ago. Then you haven't much like being supercargo on this voyage, have you? 
Oh, I said, my passion's for the sea and for ships. I ain't being a merchant. Well, then, let your father and your brother handle the financial end. I intend to. Anyway, my training's done now. In the spring, I shall sail as master of the ship. And I think you can handle it. Your father will, of course. <laughs> Two days later, at noon, the Triton docked at Darby Wharf. I walked through Salem to our huge square brick house on Chestnut Street, entered, and went directly to my father's study. You're looking well. I take it the voyage agreed with you. It did indeed, sir. A sea is good for a man. Mm. I I missed you and Bartlett at Darby Wharf, sir. Your brother Bartlett is dead. Dead? He died a month ago in Boston. But how? Carelessness. In the form of blood poisoning. Oh, poor Bartlett. Yes. Your mother and now Bartlett. God rest their souls. It seems such a pity. It is. But we all die. Well, now that Bartlett is dead, it will be needful for you to give up the sea as a career. What? I will require you to stay in Salem. Oh, no, sir. Well, you promised that after this voyage I'll be master on the next. There are plenty of masters. You shall remain in Salem and learn to manage our trade from here. Arrangement will be made for Annis and you. I shall give you a new house, and her mother has promised to furnish it. Oh, but, sir, that isn't what you I... You are, of course, upset by the suddenness of the news of your brother's death. If you like, you may go to your room with no further discussion at present. Very good, sir. You will, of course, stop in at the Balavans this evening. <laughs> and confused, I went to my room. There, a servant brought me a dish of codfish with green sauce and a bottle of sherry. An hour later, I went to the Balavan's house, where I was greeted, not by Annis, but by her younger sister, Sumatra. Ben! Oh, Ben, it's good to see you. Oh, Sumatra, how are you? I believe Annis is expecting me. Oh, come. Come, sit down. Thank you. There. Now, tell me every shift of the Triton's wheel. Be a human log for me, then. In good time, Samatra. Look, I, I thought Anna. Well, was... she'll be down presently. Tell me, did the Triton do anything really exciting? Oh, I hope you came in with the sheer poles, coach whipped, and cross pointed Turk's heads with double rose tops. <laughs> Samatra, I assure you, I don't understand a word you're saying. Now, will you go oh, in once don't. and tell any. Well, Ben Taylor, if I hear it, doesn't matter what you understand about the sea now that you're going to be a clerk. What? A mere clerk. It doesn't take much of a gale to burst your foresail, does it? Mm, I've had enough of your talk, Samatra. Now, will you kindly go tell Annas that I'm waiting? Ben, Ben, do you really hate me? I mean, when you're not in a rage? No, on the contrary. In fact, I think that one day you'll make a fine wife for the captain of a West India lugger or some incompetent fellow <laughs> trading with Bermuda Hundred. <laughs> oh, come now, Samatra. Look, I... I, I'm sorry for the insult. Forgive me. Please. Ben, don't let him do it. What? Your father, he'll ruin your life. You must stand up to him. You won't be struck dead, you know. Nonsense. I'm not afraid of my father. It's... Well, it's something a girl couldn't possibly understand. You're wrong, Ben. I understand. You just can't mute me. Isn't that it? Yes. Yes, I suppose it is, but... How did you... Listen, Ben, what you don't understand is that while at sea, one can't meet tyranny with mutiny, it's an entirely different matter on land. Well, I'm not sure there's such a difference. Well, you'd better be sure soon, or you'll be helpless. Yes, helpless. You'll marry Annis and grow fat and sallow and soft. That's what'll happen to you. Well, why not? Annis stood in the doorway, slender and palely gold. I'd forgotten how lovely she was. Her soft blonde hair was like a cloud in sifted sunlight. Her skin had a warm pallor, lending a great delicacy to her beauty. Ben, how weathered and rough you look. And you, Annis, you're as lovely as ever. <laughs> There's an ocean of things for us to talk about and arrange. Good night, Sumatra, dear. Good night. Good night, Ben. Annis held her face gently to me. It was like a tea rose. I realized I ought to kiss her, but 
I felt extremely awkward. Somehow her manner suggested more that we had been married a year than separated by the diameter of the world for two. Still, I was proud of her. In her way, she was fine and beautiful. And she possessed the caliph token. But then you're not a common sailor. You're a caliph. And you belong here in Salem. Amos, I thought you knew what the sea means to me. But then your business will require you to be around ships a great deal. Well, that's a poor substitute for being master of the Triton on a world voyage. Nonsense. You'll be the real master of all the caliph ships. It's not power I want. It's the sea in my own ship. Please, let's not quarrel on your first evening home. It's not a quarrel, Annis. It's... Oh, Ben, did you hear? Isn't it unexpectedly sweet of Mother to furnish our house? Well, isn't it? All right. I suppose. Ben? Ben! Oh, yes. Yes, of course it is. And we're going to have the most miraculous brocades and hangings. And just imagine a French boudoir. Oh, that'll be fine. Oh, Ben, we're going to be so happy. Of course. Of course we are, Anna. We'll return for Act Two of The Token, starring Mr. Dana Andrews in just a moment. The cavemen used to hit rocks together and make sparks for cooking. Well, of course, that's passe now. These are modern times, speed cooking times, general electric stratoliner range times. Here's real speed cooking. GE's high-powered Calrod units, one of them an extra high-speed unit, cooks the food almost before you get it out of the shopping bag. Push-button controls give you the exact heat for each cooking need with a mere flick of a finger. An automatic oven timer cooks the meal for you. Now, that's a lot. But the real pièce de résistance, the big bonus in this marvelous General Electric Stratoliner, is the three-way oven. It's a speed oven for your everyday single-shelf cooking. Then you can convert it to a master oven, big enough to hold a giant turkey or a small whale. Uh, No fooling, master size, this oven prepares a complete meal for 18 people. And thirdly, you can use this oven for General Electric's famous charcoal-type broiling. You can own this General Electric Stratoliner range for only about $4.89 a week after a small down payment. Consult your GE dealer for the exact terms. And now, Act Two of The Token, starring Mr. Dana Andrews. Walking home later, I felt the icy wind as sharp as needles come in off the sea. And I thought what an odorous heat there would be tonight over the mooring at the Prince's Gat in Calcutta. I reached our house and was laying aside my greatcoat when my father appeared in the doorway of his study. I have seen Captain Dove. He has praised your handling of the Triton's affairs. Thank you, sir. And did he report well of my navigational studies? Your conduct this evening, too, was admirable. I did not, in fact, quite expect such an immediate understanding of my intentions. Didn't you, sir? What's that? Oh, nothing, sir. Very well. You must understand that from now on, not adventure but finance will be the ruling spirit of this country. And the caliph must be at the center of affairs. And safe. Safe. Safe, you say? Sir, I loathe the money sharks who trade on the courage and faith of ship's masters and crews. And I must protest against... Keep your mutinous protest to yourself. Remember that I was a master for 20 years in my time, and I will not now brook insubordination. You will do as you are told. Is that clear? Very well, sir. Then good night. The helplessness of which Sumatra had spoken flooded me. For too long, I'd seen my world as the deck of a ship, and the harsh discipline of that world was a part of my being. No, I could not mutiny. A month passed. Often, I spent the late afternoon at the Balavans. Oh, Ben, I do wish you could go to the cotillion with us tonight. Well, Anna, it's another month, and I'll be out of mourning. 
Though meanwhile, I must admit, it saved me from a lot of meaningless parties. Then I'm sure you don't mean that. Sumatra, you must go dress now. And you? <laughs> you can't insult me, little sister. And I dressed early so that I could spend this time alone with Ben. I can get ready in 12 minutes. I don't doubt that. Though most ladies take longer. Ben has told me I couldn't make myself a proper lady no matter how much I tried. Did you say that, Ben? It's rather tactless of you. Don't you know Sumatra's crazy about you? No, I'm not. Though it's true I was once when I thought Ben belonged to the sea. But now, well, I don't happen to have much respect for good people, and he's being so very good. I swear she has salt water for brains. Ben, you haven't been especially nice to me, have you? Oh, come now, Sumatra. I, I didn't and mean... And what Annis told you really is true. I even have a little picture of you hidden in my room, which I'm now going to tear to bits. <laughs> Such a child. But, Ben, now that she's gone, there's something I must tell you. I do hope you won't be angry. Ben, I've lost the token. You've lost it? I'm afraid so. I've looked everywhere for it. I really have. Are you sure? Yes. <laughs> now you won't have to marry me. The charm's broken. Oh, nonsense. Still, I, I am sorry you lost it. Oh, Ben, so am I. But don't worry. It'll probably turn up. Well, let's, let's hope so. Come. I'm in a hurry now. I'll be late for the cotillion. Will you help me with my cloak? <laughs> After I saw Annis and Sumatra into their carriage, I wandered aimlessly down through the quiet streets to the docks and stood there for a while watching the icy water. A turn, lost and late, went out over the harbor, crying, lamenting. I was suddenly depressed and thought of my life to be passed in a little scented room choked with brocade and hangings. And to throw it off, I decided upon a mug of rum at the monsoon a sailor's tavern that lay in the street just behind me. I reached it quickly, pushed open the door, and went up to the bar and ordered a rum. How are you, lad? Well, Seth Hall. I knew you'd come skulking around sooner or later. Seth, I'm glad to see you. Yeah, pick up your rum. We'll go sit in the corner and have a talk. We sat down facing each other across an old plank table, and there, during the next hour... I told him the whole story, even including Annis' loss of the Kalis token. <laughs> you still get great store by your little East Indian token, don't you, lad? Well, Seth, it's, it's a strange thing. Since she told me she'd lost the token, I have a different feeling. Oh, I'll marry her, of course, but I know I'm not in love with her. Well, you can't help that. Though she's a fine girl, I hear. Well, certainly she is. But, Seth... I feel trapped. Some rum for me and the lady, you hear? Jake kill rain. Oh, now or I'll fight off your other leg. Remember him that night in Canton? I turned and saw Jake kill rain's huge hulk bending over the slight figure of a girl in a beautiful green silk dress. She turned toward him, revealing her face. It was Sumatra. For a moment I was stunned. Then I got up and went over to her. Oh, it's you. Come along, Sumatra. I'm taking you home. Thank you, but I'm not going home. Of course you are. This is no place for you. What are you doing? Leave her alone, you. You heard him. He said to leave me alone. That's right. She'll go when I go, and not before. You stay out of this, you drunken lout. Stay out of this. Why, I'll cripple you for life, Caleb. I'll drink your blood. Come along, Sumatra. Let go of me, you... You lamb shark. Let go, I said. <laughs> That's the girl. <laughs> Hit him again. You can handle him alone. I released the mucker's arm and at the same time snatched a mug of rum off the bar and threw it full into Jake Kilrain's face. I grabbed Sumatra and dragged her toward the door. Jake could kill a man with a blow, and he was now angry enough to do it. Look out behind you, Ben. I flung Sumatra from me, and half-turning saw Jake charging down on me with fire in his eyes. As he reached me, I suddenly threw myself to one side, letting him fall over my outstretched leg. When he got to his feet, 
I was waiting in front of him, and before he could move, I dropped him once and for all. You did it, Ben! You did it! Good work, lad. Come and see me tomorrow, Seth. I'll be there. But take this lady home before another ruckus starts. Hurry now. You're in a rage again, aren't you? Sumatra, you ought to be in a cage. You were just wild. Oh, Ben, I nearly died at the cotillion. It was so stupid. But finally I talked Henry Peabody into slipping out and bringing me down here. Oh? Then how'd you pick up with Jake Kilrain? Well, that sailor. Well, I didn't pick up with him, thank you. Just that I thought it'd be fun to go in the monsoon. Henry and I had a row about it, and that big ape came along, so I went in with him. Don't you know the monsoon's no place for a lady? Ah. And <laughs> I am a lady, after all. Now, if you'll take me back to your house before I go back to the cotillion, I'd like to straighten myself up a bit. When we reached the house, I noticed the light still burning in my father's study. So we slipped in quietly and turned into the library opposite. I suppose I ought to go back to the cotillion soon. What will Henry Peabody think? And whatever became of him, anyway. <laughs> That's a singularly small importance. I now. don't want to go. Not really, Ben. I'm so happy here with you. We're different, you and I. I hardly ever do what I don't want to. It's a good thing for your father. I'm not you. It wouldn't make any difference. You'd stay ashore or go to sea, as he said. I would not. Oh, yes, but you would. No, he couldn't make me. Not about that. It's too terribly important. To my father, nothing is important except what he wants. Well, why argue? After all, I'm not you. And yet I believe if I were concerned, I could do what I decided with him. Decided? About what? About you're going to see, of course. That's curious. What is? I suddenly realize that you are the only person beside me who is concerned. We... We love the same things, Ben. Yes, but it's more than that. What do you mean? I mean that I should be marrying you instead of Annis. Me? You marry me? Then I'll do it. In fact, I'll do it right now. You'll do what? Talk to your father. Make him change his mind. Oh, now, don't get excited, you little wildcat. Of course you won't. Oh, but I will. I'm the only one who can. Ben, he's not my father. He has no influence on me, don't you see? Well, that may be true, Samata, but there's a lot you don't understand about him. He can be quite violent, for one thing. Ben, if he were violent with me, would you stop him? Well, of course I would, but... All right, that's all I want to know. Come on, he's still in his study. Samantha, no, come back here. Are you coming? She went on out into the hall. I followed, knowing that there would be a frightful row. But I couldn't stop her now. She knocked once. Then when we entered the study, without waiting, my father looked up from his table, frowning slightly. His face was white and as hard as marble under the artificial light. Why, Samantha, what are you doing here? Mr. Califf, I suppose you do think it is strange to see me here so late with Ben. But it's even stranger than you imagine. Now, Samatra, let me tell May you. May I ask what this is all about? Mr. Califf, Ben and I are married. Married? Why, this is outrageous. It was, as you might guess, in a hurry. We decided only today. This is disgraceful, utterly disgraceful. Not at all. You must remember that I'm as much a Balaban as Annis, and... Besides, I suit Ben far better. Not that it matters, but might I ask in what possible way... I understand and agree with his ambition. What ambition? Why, to go to sea, of course. Ben isn't going to sea. He wasn't, as your son. But married to me, yes, he is. No, he is not. But he is. It no longer matters what you want. I'm not your son. You have no power over me. And now, I think man over Ben. Do you understand that? Get out of here. Go. And take Ben with you. To see? If there be any salt water in hell. Is that your only benediction, sir? It is. And you are no longer privileged to 
call me, sir. It slipped out for the last time. Come on, Sumatra. Ben. Ben, I haven't forced me on you, have I? I love you, Sumatra. But what of Annis? I discovered earlier tonight that I don't love Annis. Well, she doesn't really need love, you know. Just respect. And someone respectable to give it to her. Well, I'm no longer quite respectable, so she wouldn't want me now anyway. And it's you I love. Oh, Ben. Ben, dearest. But what can we do now? Go to sea. Ben, just don't you get any ideas about sailing off to the ends of the earth and leaving me behind all reefed down. Where you go, I go. As my wife should. Really, Ben? Really, darling. Well, then, you'd better do something about marrying me. <laughs> Good heavens, I forgot. I'll take care of it first thing tomorrow. Promise. It's as certain as... as though you had the caliph token. Sumatra... Tonight, Annis told me she'd lost the token. You didn't by any chance find it, did you? No, Ben. I didn't find it. I stole it. Our star, Mr. Dana Andrews, will join us again, but first... Science fiction is everywhere today. Captain Kilowatt, Tom Swift, and his electric hound dog. But uh, here's a science wonder that's fact, not fiction. You can have the kitchen of tomorrow and have it today for only about $47.20 a month after a small down payment. It's General Electric's spectacular all-electric kitchen. A refrigerator, a range, a dishwasher, a garbage disposal, and storage cabinets. You can have this kitchen right now, almost before you can lift your head and pay for it over a three-year period. Plus that, a specialist in General Electric kitchens will design the layout of your kitchen for you. Place the appliances for convenience, for efficiency, and for eye-blinding beauty. The cost for this planning service? Nary a cent. Nothing. And, uh, oh yes, are you buying or building a home? Well, plan a General Electric kitchen right into it. In most instances, you can include it right in your long-term mortgage. Your General Electric dealer would be glad to whip up a design for your own personal-styled General Electric all-electric kitchen. Talk to him about the exact terms. This electrical wonderland only costs you about $47.20 a month after a small down payment. And now, here's our star, Mr. Dana Andrews. I suppose Ben and Sumatra reached India on their future voyages. But I wonder what they'd say if they knew how I got there recently. You see, I just finished a picture in Salon called Elephant Walk. And I was thinking just now about our trip from London to Bombay. It took about 13 hours, cruising along at 550 miles an hour. Well, that's hard for me to believe, Dana. You must have gone by jet. On the only commercial jet airline in the world, a British Comet jet flight out of London. It was quite an experience. Thanks for telling us about it, Dana, and for uh, being here tonight. Thank you. Good night. Good night. This is Ken Carpenter with an invitation to be with us again next week for the General Electric Summer Theater. Join us for another half hour of fine, dramatic entertainment. Brought to you by the General Electric Company, makers of famous, dependable kitchen and home laundry appliances. Next week, the General Electric Summer Theater will bring you another kind of story. It's a tale of the Old West and the young homesteader who found a wife through an advertisement in a Kansas City newspaper. It's Van Cort's gripping story, Mail Order Bride. Our star, Mr. Robert Taylor. Tonight, you have heard The Token by Joseph Hergesheimer, specially adapted for the General Electric Summer Theater by John Meston, and starring Mr. Dana Andrews with Georgia Ellis. 
Featured in the cast were Gene Bates, Theodore Von Elts, Harry Bartell, and John Daner. Music is by Wilbur Hatch, and our producer-director is Norman McDonald. And now, this is Ken Carpenter saying, remember that fabulous General Electric dependability. You can't see it, but it's there in every General Electric appliance you buy. You can put your confidence in General Electric. This is the CBS Radio Network.